All right, so um, this, this limit is the limit as x and y approach 3 and 2. So what that means is we're looking at a three-dimensional function. So this is the z coordinate, which is our three-dimensional coordinate, the one that you know, takes us out of just the xy plane, is equal to x squared y plus 3xy cubed. And the nice, fun, easy thing about multivariable limits, there's only one nice, fun, easy thing, is that the first rule is still the same, that the first thing you should always do is you should just plug in the values and see what you get. If you get a number, then you're good. So um, as x and y approach 3 and 2, what is x squared y plus 3xy cubed approach? Well, it approaches, that would be great if I had this actually. On the pen. There we go. Sorry. I don't know. Now it says that the screen sharing is paused. I don't know how to fix that. There we go. All right. So um, means that we are having three for x. So we got three squared times our y value plus three times our x value and our y value cubed. So if you evaluate that all out, what do you get? You get 18 plus, what is that? Uh, 72, looks like 90. Oh, that's a lot of people. I must have made an arithmetic error. Oh no, everybody's saying 90 or other numbers and then never mind. Um, everybody good with that? Yeah, pretty straightforward. Just the same as with a regular limit. Um, <clears throat> until we end up with things like this that are um, going to be indeterminate. So first thing we should do with this limit, the limit is x and y approach 0 and 0. If x cubed minus y cubed over x squared plus y squared is plug them in. And if you plug them in, you end up with 0 over 0. So what are we going to do to deal with this? Any ideas? All right, difference of cubes. Okay, on the top, that's true. That is a difference of cubes. So if we wanted to rewrite that, that would be x minus y times x squared plus xy plus y squared over x squared plus y squared, and our limit as x and y approach 0 and 0 still. Um, well, the problem with that is, though, that x minus y is still 0, and x squared plus xy plus y squared is still 0, and x squared plus y squared is still 0, so it's still 0 over 0. And even if I were to try to split it up into you know, two different limits or something like that, I'd have I could have like zero times zero over zero. So one of them would still be indeterminate. So it's a good idea, but that factoring doesn't actually work out. Uh, you want to split it up as x cubed over x squared plus y squared minus y cubed over x squared plus y squared, Adrian. I don't know what LG means. What does that mean? Oh, IG, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not hip with the kids typing lingo, you know? I'm very old. Um, yeah, so if we do that, we're going to end up with x cubed over x squared plus y squared, which is still 0 over 0, and then minus y cubed over x squared plus y squared, which is also 0 over 0. And we end up with two indeterminate things. <clears throat> Any other ideas before I just uh, have to tell you what we're going to do? Uh, yeah, L'Hopital's rule is not going to work out for us here. Um, good idea, though. Multiplying by the conjugate 
also a good idea, um, but that one's not going to work out either because if you multiply, I'm not sure which one you want to multiply by, but either one, you're not going to end up with something that cancels out, unfortunately. That's a good idea also. All right, let's think back to what the new stuff that we learned was, whether we first learned it was new. Polar coordinates, that's right, Adrian, all right. So what we're gonna do is we're going to turn this into uh, polar coordinates using a substitution. So first off, we have to think about X and Y approaching zero and zero. So if X is approaching zero, just draw me a little axis here. If X is approaching zero and Y is approaching zero, what does that mean that we're going towards? We're going towards the, the origin or the pole, right? And polar coordinates, what, um, what would have to be approaching zero for us to be approaching the pole? It'd have to be R, right? If X and Y are approaching zero, then R must be approaching zero. So we're going to call this instead of the limit as X and Y approach zero, we're going to call this a limit as R approaches zero. And what would X cubed be? X is equal to what? R cosine theta. So X cubed should be R cubed cosine cubed theta minus r cubed sine cubed theta and the denominator we should end up with r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta everybody good with that any issues any questions there Uh, so in the denominator, we can factor out the r squared, right? Factor out the r squared. Um, then we have a cosine squared theta plus a sine squared theta, which should cancel out and become one. And the r squared, well, I'm dividing an r cubed minus an r cubed by r squared. So I could just turn both those things in the numerator into r's. This could become the limit as r approaches zero of r times cosine cubed theta minus sine cubed theta. Any issues with that? All right. Now, this seems like it's simple here at the end, right? Because now what happens if we plug in R? What do you get? You should get zero times cosine cubed theta minus sine cubed theta. True. And zero times anything should be zero. Um, no, Adrian, we don't need to convert it back. Actually, we're going to leave it in the in the form that it's in. Um, so zero times anything should be zero unless that thing in here is what? Unless this is infinity, right? Zero times infinity would still be indeterminate. So all we have to do is show that cosine cubed theta minus sine cubed theta for any value of theta is um, never going to equal infinity. And we should be able to do that pretty easily because we always know that cosine theta or even cosine, theta, cosine cubed theta is always less than or equal to 1 and greater than or equal to negative 1, as is sine cubed theta. which means that the largest possible value that cosine cubed theta minus sine cubed theta could attain would be what? Theoretically, the largest possible value it could attain would be up to two, right? If this is, if they were both one at the same time, even though we know that that's not true. And the lowest it could possibly be would be negative two, even though that's not possible either since they can't both be negative one at the same time. Um, so we know that this cosine cubed minus sine cubed is a finite number. So since this is zero times something that's finite, we can say that this equals zero. That makes sense?
a nice little substitution using polar coordinates, another use for polar coordinates that uh, you'll see and do a lot more in depth when you take a Calc 3 class next year, but just thought we'd show it to you now because, you know, it's fun. Um, yeah, I mean, as R approaches, as you approach R equals zero, the theta value can be any theta value. If you think about it, Adrian, you can, you can approach R equals zero from any number of an infinite number of different angles, right? Especially if you're in the, you know, three-dimensional system. Um, but no matter what that, you know, theta is never going to be, theta itself is never going to be indeterminate. Theta is always going to be a real, a real number angle. Um, yes, that's correct. Nick. The answer is zero. And so when you take Calc 3 next year, your, your professor will go into a lot more detail about um, looking at all the different possibilities of how we might approach R equals zero um, from these different angles because it's possible. Uh, that you might not just have an R over here, you know, you might have, you know, if you have something like R plus one over here, let's say times the cosine cubed minus sine cubed, well, R plus one, um, if, if R is approaching zero is one times some finite number, but this is variable. And so that one, we would have to say it doesn't exist if you have something like that. Uh, but we won't worry too much about that now. We'll We'll focus on the basics of it. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to test you on these first couple of problems that we're doing today. I just thought it, you guys might have some interest in them. Probably wishful thinking on my part, but that's okay. So what about this one? Take a look at this one. Plug in your zero and your zero, you get zero over zero. Um, see if you can come up with a, a way to work through that one. I'm going to go let my dog out because she's just sitting here whining at me, and then I'll be back in about 30 seconds. So see if you can get that one started. All right, so what'd you guys do with this one? Anything, anything at all? Did you convert it into a limit as our approach is zero? Okay, and so limit is our approach is zero of what? The x is going to be our cosine and the y squared is going to be r squared sine squared. So this will end up being r cubed cosine theta sine squared theta over x squared plus y squared, which what's x squared plus y squared? Could have just turned that into r squared last time. I don't know why we didn't do that, but and x squared plus y squared is r squared in polar coordinates. And so what do we end up with? The limit as r approaches zero of r cosine theta sine squared theta. Um, this time we'll be a little bit more formal about how we show that this is not zero times infinity just for fun. Um, we know that cosine theta sine squared theta, since cosine of theta is always between one and negative one, and sine squared theta is always between zero and one, we should know that cosine theta sine squared theta is always between one and negative one if you multiply them together. 
and we can go through and we can actually use uh, on top of our polar coordinate substitution we can use the, the squeeze theorem here and multiply each piece by r so this is negative r is less than or equal to r cosine theta sine squared theta is less than or equal to positive r and the limit is r approaches zero of negative r is zero and the limit is r approaches zero positive r is zero and therefore by the squeeze theorem or sandwich theorem whatever you want to call it the limit as r approaches zero of r cosine theta sine squared theta is also equal to zero and as a result this is also equal to zero so all these little little things that we're learning about now um, or that you learned about last year also they're going to pop up when you move into uh, next level of calc and when you go into differential equations and all the higher math classes do one more of these this one's a little bit different though any thoughts on this one First thing you should do is what? Plug it in, that's right. Still always plug it in. You plug it in, you end up with natural log of one over zero, which is zero over zero. So still undetermined. Bummer. So now what? All right, so yeah, we've been doing the R substitution. Um, so that's a good idea, Darius, but this one, it's not going to end up working out that way. So we want to try and look for, are there any, any patterns within this fraction that we're looking at? Any, anything that's similar about the numerator and the denominator? Yeah, exactly. And we're just going to do a U sub here. So what do you want to sub um, as your U sub? Yep, X squared Y to the fourth. Exactly. So if we let u equal x squared y to the fourth um, first off as x and y approach zero and zero then what's u approaching you should be approaching zero as well yep good um, and so now our substitution turns this into a limit as u approaches zero of natural log of one minus to u over 3u and so now we should just be able to go ahead and plug that in except that when we just go ahead and plug that in we still end up with zero over zero and so at this point now I, a couple of you sent me messages asking if you could use Locatel's rule on the packet and I said don't use it yet well I'm going to break my own rule and I'm just going to use Locatel's rule here real quick so this becomes the limit as u approaches zero what's the derivative of natural log of one minus two u you should know that already right it is what negative two over one minus two u good Darius negative two over one minus two u and then all of that is over three now we can plug our zero in we end up with negative 2 over 1 minus 0. So negative 2 over 1 all over 3. We get negative 2 thirds. So lots of these uh, tricks that we're used to nowadays um, with the polar stuff and with the 
uh, L'Hopital's rule with the new substitutions, it'll all be super convenient in Calc 3. Um, the first one, Adrian, well, the first one wasn't indeterminate. Or are you, talk, are you talking about the first one that was indeterminate? Yeah, so yeah, it's because it's two variables. You can't use L'Hopital's rule directly with the two variables. You got to convert it into a single variable limit first. Any other questions there? Yeah, even using implicit, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work out, Nick, unfortunately. Um, reason being, because what, what variable are you gonna take the derivative with respect to? You're gonna take the derivative with respect to x, you're gonna take the derivative with respect to y, you're gonna end up with these dy dx terms in there, and it's just gonna be, yeah, it's a nightmare. You gotta have, you gotta have one single variable for a little bit tells rule. Cool. All right. So um, <clears throat> those three or four problems that we just did were just for fun. So hopefully that was really fun and exciting for you. Um, let's see. What we're going to do now is a couple of things that are for this class. First is we're going to talk about the definition of continuity. Um, Hopefully you remember the definition of continuity. We're looking to determine if a function is continuous um, at a number C. Then we have to make sure that all three of these conditions that I've written here are satisfied. First of all, f of C has to be defined. f of C has to exist. Second, the limit as x approaches C of the function has to exist. And third, the limit as x approaches C of f of x has to equal f of C. Everybody remember that from last year, definition of continuity? We use that for like some piecewise functions sometimes to see if it's continuous at a point. Um, or sometimes you're given like a piecewise function and asked to find some constant that's in it that makes it continuous for all real numbers. So we're gonna should have had a couple in that packet of problems like that that I gave you, but we'll we'll talk about something like that in a bit. Everybody good with that? All right. And we remember the three different types of discontinuities. We have removable discontinuities where it's just a hole, or removable discontinuities where it's a hole that the point's filled in somewhere else, still a discontinuity. And so removable discontinuities. Jump discontinuities where we're going along and we jump up to some other value. Generally, these are you know piecewise functions. These removable ones, especially this first type here, are often rational functions. And we also have infinite discontinuities or approaching a vertical asymptote. So those are our three different types of discontinuities on the AP test. If they ask you to classify, the discontinuities need to be able to tell if it's removable, jump, or infinite. So the infinite discontinuity or ask your vertical asymptote is going to come from something that makes the denominator zero, but the numerator is not zero, and your removable ones will come from both the numerator and the denominator being zero at that certain value of C. And then um, the jump discontinuities will generally be piecewise defined functions. Everybody good so far? Okay, Darius says yes, perfect. All right. Next, we'll talk about the intermediate value theorem. Real quick and easy also, this should all be review. Um, intermediate value theorem says that if we have a function that's continuous on a closed interval from A to B, then we can find any number between F of A and F of B, we'll call that number W. So for any W we can choose between F of A and F of B, there must be a C value that lies on the open interval between A and B, such that F of C is equal to W. Basically, if we have a continuous function, um, pick a Y value between your starting and your ending points, and you should be able to get that from an X value between your starting and your ending points. That's all the intermediate value theorem is saying. And the biggest thing that we use it for is to draw conclusions about where there are zeros of functions. 
So if I have a function that, you know, I know that at, let's say, x equals negative 1, my function is negative, and at x equals 5, my function is positive, I know that somewhere between negative 1 and 5, there's a place where the function equals 0, or there's a place where the function crosses through the x-axis, or somewhere where there's an x-intercept in there. Everybody remember that? All right. Everybody remember how to verify the intermediate value theorem on an interval. Hopefully so. First step in verifying the intermediate value theorem on an interval is to show what about that function. Good. Yeah, lots of people here that it's continuous, right? That it has continuity. So um, we're talking about the interval from zero to two. So we're going to say that f of x is continuous on the interval zero to two. And what's the reason why this particular function is continuous on the interval from zero to two? Uh, good, Nick, you already wrote it there. Because it's a polynomial, right? Because it's a polynomial function. And we will remember that polynomial functions are always continuous for all real numbers. All polynomial functions are continuous for all real numbers. And as far as rational functions go, the same rational functions are always continuous for all real numbers, except for any values that make the denominator equal to zero. Other than that, um, rational functions are also always continuous. And you can just state that as a known fact. All right. so. If f of x is continuous on 0 to 2 because it's polynomial, what's the next thing we need to do? We need to figure out what f of 0 is. What's f of 0? Should be 0, right? Okay. And what's f of 2? f of 2 should be negative 8. So that means that for any W, let's say for every W that is greater than negative eight and less than zero, there should exist a C that is on the interval from zero to two, such that F of C is equal to W. And what's the process for proving that that's true? We should start with this inequality that negative eight is less than W is less than zero. And what do we need to replace the W with? Anybody remember what to replace the W with? Yeah, negative C cubed, exactly, because F of C, which happens to be negative C cubed, should be equal to W. So we're looking at negative 8 is less than negative C cubed is less than 0. First thing we'll do is divide by the, divide by the negative, which will give us 8 is greater than C cubed is greater than 0 when we flip the signs. And when we take the cube root, we'll end up with two is greater than C is greater than zero. Hold on one second, I'm gonna help my son with something. All right, sorry about that. Um, and so by proving that that C value must be between zero and two for any W between negative eight and zero, that's it, we verified that the intermediate value theorem is true for this particular function. So I just start with the inequality representing the y values and then plug in f of c as your w value and then just sort of undo it to get back to zero to two.
Any questions on that? Any issues with that? All right. Can we show that this function has a zero between one and two? The answer is yes, we should be able to. What's the first step in doing that? First step in doing that should be to show that it is continuous. We'll state it's continuous because it's a polynomial. Good. So f is continuous because it's a polynomial. And then we'll find f of 1. What's f of 1? I think it's negative 4 if I did that arithmetic correctly real quick. Oh, good. Yeah, negative 4. Good. Um, and f of 2, what's f of 2 going to be? I was out to be 17, but I just did that without checking myself. Is that 17? You guys agree with 17 or no? All right, Nick got 17. All right. We're going to assume that's right, because um, it is. All right, so now, because we've got a sign change from negative 4 to 17, uh, we know that for, for every W that is less than 17 and greater than negative 4, there should be A C on the interval from one to two, such that f of c is equal to w. We don't actually have to go through the whole process this time. We can just say that w equals zero is on the interval from negative four to seventeen. Therefore, by the IVT. f of c equals zero on the interval from one to two, at least once. It could happen more than once, but it happens at least one time. Good or no? The interval one to two is an open interval, Nick. Always a, yeah, the result of the intermediate value theorem is always on the open interval. All right, this is the last, uh, last problem I intend to do today. So I'm actually gonna let you guys go quite a bit early, which means I'll expect that you're working on that packet for this last 20 to 30 minutes of class here. So we want to find all values of A so that f of x is continuous for all real numbers. So how do we start this off? Okay, so um, finding the limit of the first one at x equals negative 1 is a start, but it's not actually what we really want to do first. First, we need to state 
we want this to be continuous for all real numbers. So we need to state why it's already continuous. We know that it's continuous on the interval from negative infinity to negative one and the interval from negative one to infinity. Why is it continuous on that interval? Because it is a rational function. So first we need to state that it's continuous everywhere except at this one point. So it's continuous on that because it's a rational function and our denominator, which is x plus one equals zero and x equals negative one. So that's our first start. State that it's continuous everywhere. Now we're gonna look for the limit as x approaches negative one because for it to be continuous at x equals negative one, we need to meet all three pieces of that uh, continuity definition. One, that the limit exists, one, that the function exists, and one, that those two things are the same. So now we'll show that the limit as x approaches negative one of f of x is something. And so how do I deal with that top piece? Without using L'Hopital's rule, how do I deal with that top piece? Yep, factor it out, Ryan. How does it factor out? It should become x plus 1 to the third power. That's just binomial theorem expansion there. x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. And the denominator, we have an x plus 1. So this becomes the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x plus 1 squared. And what do we get as that limit? It should come out to be zero. So we know that the limit as x approaches negative one exists. Then we have to figure out what is f of negative one. f of negative one is negative a plus five. So that's a number, right? We don't know what a specifically is at the moment, but negative a plus five is a number. So met the first criteria, met the second criteria. Third criteria is that those two things have to be the same. So negative a plus five needs to equal zero, which tells us that a needs to equal five. So if a is five, this function is continuous for all real numbers because it's, first off, it's continuous everywhere except negative one because of the fact that it's a rational function. And second, it's met the three pieces of continuity at that single point where we weren't sure if it was continuous, that point at negative one. Right, limit exists, function exists, and they're equal to each other. Any questions on that? Everybody good with that? Cool. 